Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment. There it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us. But it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. OK, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish, a genome that was sequenced just a couple years ago, is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. It falls apart. And this is something else that showed up in the trial. Um, this is technical information, but it basically shows that Doolittle has worked out an evolutionary scheme for how all the factors evolved from a single set of components that existed before blood clotting was evolved, and that leads to an evolutionary prediction. And the evolutionary prediction is shown over here and over here in another paper. And that is that the protein should have very specific relationships to each other, the different factors. And lo and behold, you can search the genomes of a host of organisms, and it does exactly that. The relationships match. So what this means with respect to blood clotting is claims that you need every component to be present for biological function. That's the claim. Those claims are false. The second thing is a testable pathway has been proposed. I showed it on the previous slide. Careful analysis of that pathway shows it fits the evolutionary prediction. And there's absolutely no scientific support at all for any suggestion that the pathway was produced in a single step of creation or design. And that's what I mean by the collapse of the intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now, the one thing that I haven't shown you, because here I'm just going to read you part of the judge's decision, was a similar demonstration on the evolution of the immune system. And Behe has written, and it's part of in Pandas, that Darwinian explanations of the evolution of the, the immune system are hopeless and doomed to failure. Well, he wrote that about 10 years ago. And it turns out, as I described in my testimony, a flurry of research has shown exactly how the gene shuffling system in the immune system did evolve. And the judge captured this perfectly in terms of what happened in trial. On cross-examination, Professor Beehive was questioned about this claim that science would never find an evolutionary explanation for the immune system. He was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he ignored all this and simply insisted that it still wasn't sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was simply not good enough. And the, 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 if you want theater in the courtroom, what the lawyer did was held up the first paper, have you read it? He said, no, this is a paper on the evolution of the immune system. Here's the second paper, have you read that? Yeah, I read that one, uh, so forth and so on. And gradually, all 56 papers were piled up in front of the witnesses, a witness all nine books and all of these textbooks, and he simply said, it's evidence that is not good enough for me. I think that made a very strong impression on the judge that here was someone who, regardless of scientific credentials, was determined to ignore the empirical evidence rather than to go by it. The fourth thing that really happened on the trial was that evolution was exposed as a religious doctrine masquerading as science. And I bring this up because I think it is particularly relevant to Ohio. And many of you may think, wait a minute, this doesn't mention uh, religion. It's not really that way. But I want to bring all of you, uh, uh, bring to your attention the federal court test for uh, 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 the actions of a government that might or might not infringe on the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Establishment Clause. And the established precedent is something known as the Lemon Test. And it's a court case of Lemon versus somebody else. And it basically says whatever the government body does, the action has to have a legitimate secular purpose. It can't have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. And then finally, even if it, even if it, all oh, this is okay, it still must not result in the excessive entanglement of government and religion. So what the judge did was to apply the lemon test. This is the strictest test. This is the most lenient test. And it turns out he found that the actions of the Dover board failed all three prongs of the lemon test. 
They showed, for example, that there was no legitimate secular purpose in promoting the teaching of intelligent design. And, and why is this the case? Well, one of the things you might ask is, you know, if intelligent design is a religious idea, so what? What's wrong with introducing it in the science classroom? And this is part of the judge's decision that I think really bears, uh, uh, bears making note of. Introducing this as an idea into a science classroom, as he points out, it sets up what will be perceived by students as a God-friendly science, and that's intelligent design, one that explicitly mentions an intelligent designer, and the other science, evolution, that has no position. What I told the judge is I thought a false duality would be produced. It would tell students quite explicitly, choose God on the side of intelligent design, or choose science on the side of evolution and reject God. And introducing such religious conflict into the classroom, the judge wrote, is very dangerous because it, it forces students to choose between God and science, not a choice that school should be forcing on them. The last question that I was asked was related to this, and I pointed out to the court that the Lord has blessed me with two daughters. I brought both of my daughters up in my faith, and I also brought both of them up to love science. And one of them has actually become a biologist. The other one has become a teacher. Alas, a history teacher, but we don't speak of her. Um, <laughs> but the point that I wanted to make to the judge is that when my daughters were being educated, I not only wanted them to understand and, and, and adhere to our faith, but I also wanted them to love and understand science. And if they were ever placed in a classroom where they were told explicitly or implicitly, choose the religious theory on this side or the anti-religious theory on this side, choose between God and science, I as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, would have been outraged at this false choice between religion and science being foisted upon them. And that, as far as I was concerned, was exactly the problem with the Dover policy in terms of introducing this idea into the science classroom. Now, the Dover board, of course, argued that their statement was not religious. And this is the four-paragraph statement that was read to students. And if you look at it quickly, um, I like to paraphrase this statement by saying, Basically, uh, kids, we've got to teach you evolution because the state says we have to. Um, then it says evolution, we're going to teach you that, but it's pretty shaky. Um, and there's a lot of problems and gaps. There is this other really cool theory called intelligent design. You will notice that there is no mention of any problems or any gaps in intelligent design. And by the way, we've got this really good textbook in there. Um, and then keep an open mind. Uh, talk about this with your families. And by the way, we have to give you a test at the end of the semester, and evolution will be on the test. And what that essentially does, and the judge certainly agreed, is to undermine evolution and to undermine it for the purpose of promoting intelligent design. Now, you might say, well, intelligent design is not religious. Um, I think it is. But you know what? You don't have to listen to me. And you don't have to listen to the expert witnesses for our side of the case. As the judge pointed out, you can listen to the expert witnesses on the other side of the case. Because it turns out, Dr. Behe said that it is implausible that the designer is a natural entity, so it must be supernatural. Uh, Dr. Minnick said that intelligent design requires the ground rules of science to be broadened, broadened so that supernatural forces can be considered. And Professor Stephen Fuller said that the project of ID is to change the ground rules of science to include the supernatural. Once again, don't take it from our side of the case. Take it from the other side of the case. ID is, in fact, inherently religious. Now. What does this have to do with Ohio, you might say? Because after all, we're not teaching intelligent design in Ohio. The lesson plans adopted by the Ohio Board of Education, they don't mention intelligent design. And Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute, and this is a posting that Steve has on a website. Um, Stephen Meyer even came in front of the Ohio Board of Education, and he promoted not intelligent design, but a teach the controversy prom uh, promotion. Now, this sounds very good. It sounds very neutral. Uh, it seems to have nothing to do with creationism. So you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with creation or creationism? Well, look at the whole website. And look where Meyer actually posted this work. He posted it on creationdigest.com. And he clearly intended this as a friendly audience to review the news as to what he thinks is happening in Ohio. This is clearly a backdoor way to sneak this um, into the classroom. 